when you look at the fundamentals, you can see that the chart has been up, 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 up. And with the exception of March, it recovered nicely. Well, I think since the time we've mentioned it on Market Mondays, the stock is still up like 150%. So for those of you who took action, absolutely great job. So the next five threats that could cause a crash because we're not out of the clear are these. We got to talk about this. Corporate debt. Corporate debt is going up and we haven't even begun to see the cracks in the commercial real estate yet. We have the student loan crisis. My God, when that bubble pops, ooh, ooh. I think <laughs> that if that pops while commercial is under, it would be worse than the Great Depression. I want you guys to Google on your own how big the student loan crisis is. And with people not working, if in this after these three years, when interest rates finally go back up, we could see one of the greatest economic disasters we've ever seen if they pop at the same time. Um, I think I skipped over one. Three is unemployment. I know it's great to, for the stimulus of the economy, but zero interest rates for this long period of time actually is going to hurt us. And then for those of you in California, and I hope it doesn't spread to New York, but I've heard it's gotten pretty, pretty bad. This homelessness epidemic is going to sweep the country. So if you have these all tied in together, these are going to be the catalyst for the next crash. And if I'm looking according to data, the next crash that we have in sight will be 2027, which is not that far away. Given that it's going to take probably three years from us to recover from what happened during COVID. Um, so the reason I say interest isn't good because in 1932, we went to zero interest. And then in 1937, we went back into recession. So history tends to repeat itself. Of course, online, we've seen all these posts about the types of recoveries. So I want to show you, you have an L shaped recovery, which we have the greatest probability that we're going to be in, which could be several years. Depending on who wins the election, what policies are in place, that will dictate how long this recovery takes place. You have a U shape, which is usually one to two years. The famous W where we go down and we bounce up and we come down. Great, that's two years. And then a V shaped recovery. There's no chance in hell that we're gonna have a V shaped recovery. The country's doing too bad. There's not enough companies in the stock market that are doing well. And they're not telling the truth about the jobs numbers. So we're either gonna be in a U shaped recovery or an L shaped recovery. <laughs> Here's the most important thing I want you to remember. Regardless of what kind of recovery we're in, do not let anyone trick you out of your spot about investing consistently because your goal is to get to at least 10,000 shares so you can get to freedom. Regardless of what everyone else's plan is, you have to stick to yours. Eliminate the noise and lock in. I'm begging you, please lock in and do not change anything. Um... And I know index funds are not the sexiest thing on earth. And from a legal standpoint, you can't do this, but I wish they were called guaranteed return funds. I was looking at a post this weekend and um, even venture capital firms are not producing 12% a year. But I think because we get so caught up in the hype and the news cycle and seeing everyone else's wins, we often think that eight to 12% is not good. Rashad, you said this weeks ago, like we're the only community who thinks eight to 12% is a bad return. That's a fact. And, a fact. and as a result, we'll chase a bigger gain, a hundred percent, but a hundred percent gain. And if you lose 90% of it, and then once you get into taxes, you would have been better off with that 12% anyway. So I want to give you context. So you guys don't think that I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. Again, Dow Jones on average, 10.9% return over 30 years, Russell 2000, which is smaller companies, 9.29%. The S&P 500 from 1957 to 2018 averages 7.9%. It's hard to turn that down. It's not the sexiest thing, but for those of you that are bleeding and you're under 25%, you're under 30% and you're in losses right now, lean back to indexes. A safe 18 to 15% is better than being up 30 and then losing 25. So I want to finish this out real quick. And then we can go to questions. They swagger jacked you on this too, Ian, by the way. It happens, man. Listen, <laughs> we, we just have to be 
happy that we're vessels to give this information, right? A blessing seen, to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. I've seen so much copying, I've just learned to enjoy it. They, they seen his album cover and then they jacked that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> this is a part of the process. I'm learning to just say namaste and keep creating, right? So in 1932, 1940, 2000, and of course, 2008, are the only four election years the market has been down. Some of you have been asking, how is the market going to perform this election? If we're going to go with history, we should still end up. Great. What about the bond market? Okay, bonds give a smaller return. So in 2008, 5.2% return. 2012, 4.2. 2016, 2.7. So we're back to the same correlation of stocks and bonds. What to do in a market is as old as dirt. The hard part is people don't stick with a plan. That's the only thing we have to do. The market is going to go down. Yes, it's going to tank. But if you hold it and ride it out for the long term, you'll be A-OK. -okay. You will be A-OK. -okay. So I'm going to answer a couple questions that you guys have been sending me via DM and threatening me if I don't answer. <laughs> so I, I want to give as much value as I can so we can all level up together. So write this down. How do we determine multiple entry points to buy? You can use a 200 moving average paired with a 50 moving average and, to, and a 20 period moving average. So 200, 50, and 20. The 200 will be the load, the boat area. The 50 will be the second area that you wanna get in and the 20 will where you wanna have the least amount of shares going in, okay. Given that women tend to make less, what's the template on how to invest from the ages of 20 to 30? You got a great advisor. I don't know where he got them shades from, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him answer this later. Hey, you think 20... top secret. Everything top hey, secret. Listen, man, you got to put, put me on a privacy list and let me know. Carlene, send my tickets. Uh, <laughs> from 20 to 30 years old, I think you should invest 25%. I know some people are going to disagree. I'm going to say this because the median wealth for black families is so low. We have to invest more. I've been seeing the article that goes around that says that we have 17 to 20,000. That's a lie. That's a lie. From 30 to 50, I will bump it down to probably 18%. And then in your 50s, I will probably go 12 to 15% of your income. You have to invest more earlier so you can take advantage of compound interest. Because when you get 50, healthcare costs are going to go up. You're going not going to have as much money. Um, you're going to have other people to take care of. So it's not feasible to start investing that late and put all of your money into the market. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>